Good afternoon, friends. Steve Sisler here, um, live on Facebook. This will be uh, posted to my YouTube channel, so if you if you miss it, you can always go to youtube.com forward slash Stephen Sisler for my videos. I actually started the channel um, not too long ago, so trying to build up uh, a consistent base of good friends and those interested in the world of human behavior. So, all right, we're going to jump right back into this. What are we talking about? We're talking about axiology today. This is part two. We went over part two the other day, part one the other day. This is part two. And I'm going to open up by reminding you of what we talked about. The first thing is the one, two, threes of axiology. So we have one mind, that's our brain, and in our brain, we have all the psychic energy for making decisions and doing things in the world. And that comes from four primary emotions. Number two, there are two worlds. The two worlds are the outer world and the inner world. The outer world is those things around us, and a lot of people are considered outer directed when they get their energy from outside sources. And then we have the inner world, and some people are considered interdirected when their source of strength and power comes from within themselves. So they're self-reliant versus dependent. Um, and so uh, important things to remember. And then there are three dimensions. And we talked about the scientific terms for these dimensions, and those dimensions are intrinsic extrinsic and systemic and so the intrinsic world is the part of our thinking that we use to relate to people the extrinsic world is the part of our brain that we use to do things and the systemic part of our brain is the part of the brain that we use to think so uh, you could say feeling doing and thinking or you could say relating, doing, and thinking. It's important to know that. So I'm going to jump to a screen share. We're talking about the outer world right now, and we're in the third dimension within uh, that outer world. So uh, the thinker. So this is structured thinking, which is the systemic portion um, of this world. So I wanted to point this out. Somebody was asking me offline about a book. Um, uh, and uh, this is probably the best book out there um, on axiology. I'm going to warn you, it's disgusting. <laughs> it's really dense, but it's the best one. Uh, there's not much out there, actually. Um, and so... Uh, uh, Leon Pomeroy uh, is probably got the best book out there and it's it's deep it's thick and it's like wading through mud and hip boots it's a lot of math and different things like that so those of you that are really uh, what is all this coming in here well those of you that are really uh, uh, oh man um, that's an appointment I am missing um, and so, uh, I'm going to have to answer that. Um, yeah, hold on a second. Sorry about this. Um, okay. Um, yeah, it was a potential lunch date and I had another meeting that came up that I forgot about because I didn't have it in the calendar. Oh, I hate it when these videos get interrupted with little things like that. But hey, that's life, right? Um, okay, so let's get back into into this. So how clearly do I understand 
what is defined in no uncertain terms. So this is the uh, this is the axiological framework of the third dimension, which is uh, structured thinking. Hence the word structure. So this is thinking that is around rules, regulations, fulfilling concepts completely. Okay, so it, it needs to be fulfilled completely. And I might have mentioned this earlier, you're either pregnant or you are not pregnant. You're not ever sort of pregnant. So the concept of pregnancy is completely either fulfilled or not fulfilled as a concept. So a stop sign, you've either stopped at the intersection or you didn't stop at the intersection. There's no rolling stop at the intersection because the concept's not fulfilled. Um, and so you have to understand that this is an important piece and uh, how people think about it, you know, determines a lot. So this means, can I understand rules, regulations, policies, procedures, budgets, P&L statements, standard operating procedures, authorities, forecasts, anything that has solid definition around it. And so we either see these things very clearly with a big open aperture, a lot of light coming in. We understand long-term planning, what we have to do, why we have to do it that way, that this has to be finished before we can start that. Like those kinds of concepts is really about uh, the regulated thinking pattern or what we call systemic judgment. Um, and so it's important that you understand that this is around structure. How great is my clarity around structured entities, structured ideas, future plans that must have a beginning, a middle and an end. So that's what, uh, structured thinking is about? Or do I overtly or covertly disregard what ought to be and replace it with what I think? Okay, now this is where this gets really important. Depending upon our level of clarity, it's going to determine how much of what ought to be done we can see. What's a good example of that? If I work in a kitchen, I years ago when I was a teenager, I worked in a steakhouse and I worked in the kitchen and I was the dishwasher. Like that lasted two nights and I quit. <laughs> it was horrible. Um, because I did not have a good attention span. It was very, very difficult for me. And so, you know, being able to, I told you the story in the last video about the lag clips at the manufacturing company screwed it all up, shut the whole plant down. Um, so being able to organize the dishes and what needed to be done next, it takes me a very long time to work all that out. But once I work it out, um, I'm okay. So I cannot hit the ground running when it comes to what to do and when to do it. And so when it comes to what ought to be done as far as rules, regulations, procedures, protocols, and things like that, what do I do? Well, I'm the type that will overtly or covertly disregard what ought to be and replace it what I think is better. So you could call that unconventional, which is what it's called. Um, so it's a narrower view of what ought to be that doesn't encompass this, 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 only what I'm seeing, it's more narrow. Um, and so it's important to understand uh, what that's going to look like for you. Do I think in terms of black and white or gray? So this is towards the way things are supposed to be. So when we measure your attention, is your attention balanced? In other words, I know that it could be done this way or it could be done that way. And this is the right way and this is the wrong way. And I know both ways. I know the right way and the wrong way. Um, 
or am I so bent on doing things what the way I think is right that I fail to do the right thing? This happens a lot. Certain brain types are so bent on doing what they believe is right that they fail to do the right thing. In other words, not everything is so cut and dry. But if you have excessive attention in this structured thinking world set, then your actions become more perfectionist oriented. Everything has to fit right. Everything has to be done right. We can't do this unless we do this first. Um, we can't move that because we haven't moved this yet. We need to do this. If you've been around people like this and you're different than that, it's annoying. And so this is because of the way you're viewing the world in your structured thinking. And so it's important to understand uh, what that looks like. Am I too black and white? Some people are very, very black and white. And we call that regulated. They have a regulated thinking pattern. Um, some parents that are like this, they're very regulated in their thinking. They have a very high power orientation in their motivational orientations. They have a very high uh, economic orientation, which means they think in terms of what am I getting out of this situation? And if I'm not getting enough out of this situation, I don't want to be a part of the situation. And so they become what we call owner oriented. They tend to own everything. They own the conversation. They own the space. They own where it's going. And so if you have that with a high regulated thinking set in your motivational orientation and you also have strict, very strong, positive, attentive, structured thinking going on in your brain, then as a parent, you might look at your child and say, listen, I brought you into this world. I can take you out. Like that's how things start going. Everything becomes very either or versus both and. In other words, there are some people that believe there's only one way to skin a cat. And then there are other people that believe there's a hundred ways to skin a cat. It's just up to... Uh, whoever you are and what the situation is and what that looks like. And so it's really important to know. Structured thinking is about how many ways can I see that are available to skin this cat the way a cat ought to be skinned. Like what do I see for options there? Um, and then what is my attention level towards those things? Is it negative? Or is it positive? If it's negative, you may be in a situation when somebody says, okay, let's do some housekeeping first before we get into the talk. You ever heard that? You're at a meeting, you're at an event, and somebody comes up, you're waiting for the main speaker, and it's somebody you don't know, and they start opening up with, we're going to go over the housekeeping rules, and you immediately sit back in your seat, fold your arms, roll your eyes, and just wait for them to finish because you're not even listening to what the rules are because you don't really give a crap what the rules are, okay? That shows that you have uh, a more negative, cautious approach to what ought to be um, in this worldview. Now, where do regulated thinking patterns tend to play out the most in the world today? Politics and religion, okay? So, um ideological, so ideological frameworks have a lot of black and white thinking in them, okay? We see this playing out in the country right now. I say something, it's a little bit different or it's a little gray or here, what happens? You're racist. Like they go right to a conclusion, you can't you know, uh, vary from anything. It's either this or nothing. Like that's a very strict, narrow, unconventional viewpoint within the dimension of uh, systemic 
judgment or within the dimension of structured thinking. What does that look like, you know, in a religious context? Uh, well, right here. Uh, uh, this is a sign at a Baptist church. I kissed a girl and liked it. Then I went to hell. <laughs> okay. So you, you may have run into people like this. Um, it's very, very narrow and very, very strict way of thinking in the world. Now, the issue that comes with what we call static thinking, so there's static thinking and there's fluid thinking. So static thinking is one way. It's my way or the highway. Fluid thinking uh, is not that way. Fluid thinking means uh, there's movement, there can be change, we could do this, we could do that, but we don't really have to simply because if this changes, we could change this. These types of maneuvering. So going from a solid black and white concept to a more gray concept that gives us what we call wiggle room. So some human beings uh, allow no wiggle room. Uh, is logic and reasoning losing relevance in today's world? Okay, that's such a great question. So, to answer that, Stuart, um, when it comes to regulated thinking as a motivational orientation, out of all seven motivational oriented elements, which are an aesthetic element, uh, which is a creative element, um, a uh, uh, an economic element, um, a individualistic element. There's a power element. There's a curiosity element. Uh, uh, there's a sacrificial element, and then there's a regulated element or a compliance element. Out of all the national norms, the compliance element is the lowest and it is dropping the fastest okay so what's happening is is people are finding their own personal reasons to do the things they do so there was there was a time when people looked for a standard an operating procedure for operating life in the world outside of themselves say up here and then everybody stepped out of themselves and tried to live up to the standard a fixed standard that was up here that we're reaching up to okay so in a religious context uh, whoever you're following then you look at what you believe they have set as a standard and then you live up to that standard well, obviously, consistently falling short of it. Um, so think of Judaism, for instance. So they had the law, the Mosaic law. So, or the Ten Commandments. You know, you either have killed somebody or you didn't kill them, right? You didn't almost kill them, or though you can almost kill somebody. But if you do kill them, then they're dead. And then you violated the thou shalt not kill law. And so it's a very black and white law. And so uh, we would be in, the, in, in, in those narratives, they were given a set of rules and standards outside of themselves. All right. So came to Moses on a mountain, right? And smoke and fire and all that. If you've ever watched the movie. Um, and, uh, and so everybody has to align with the standard here. And if they didn't, they were out. Okay. So that's the concept. Then there was a time through Judaism where it was the times of the judges. And what it says is people were doing what they considered right in their own eyes. And then they had to bring somebody in and fix that whole mess because everybody was falling off the wagon. Um, so you've got human, sometimes in theological realms, they call this 
quote, the avalanche of sin. All right, so the avalanche of sin is when everybody gets a second chance and then over time it turns into this avalanche and then it all falls apart. Somebody comes in, has to fix it. Then we set a new standard and then we all try to live back up to that standard again. And it just keeps cycling through time, right? And so if you read, if you've ever read, you know, the judges, you could see this happening throughout uh, history in the history of Judaism. And so in the Torah, whatever. So anyway, that being said, um, what we have now taking place is people coming up with personal self-concepts of what they believe is right within themselves and then living down to it. Okay, now that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad idea. It's just that there are many people now not putting themselves under a specific code, rule, or law um, in that way. Then you have a whole nother group of people that say, well, back to the Judeo-Christian model, there's now a law of love. So if you've ever read this uh, uh, in, in, in the New Testament texts where it talks about um, a new commandment I give to you, you know, that you love me even as I have loved you and that, you know, you love your neighbor as yourself. That, so there's this new code, this new moral law uh, called the law of love. So every time I'm about to make a decision, I have to ask myself in this particular situation, what would love do? Well, the problem that sneaks in with this one is everybody defines it differently based upon their worldview, their axiological set of thinking skills, their temperament, their behavior, and their motivational orientations. So you've got all these variables coming in that really frame how individuals are going to do things in the world. So some people are static, some people are fluid. Years and years ago, I mean, this goes back to about 2005, um, I was profiling a family and there was a girl in this family who was sort of 14 years old, maybe, and she wanted to get a uh, belly button piercing. Um, and so all hell broke loose in the family over this. And I got a call from the family, from the father, and um, I had to go out there and meet with them, and I profiled everybody so I could say, okay, I want to see how these people are thinking, right? So what happened was the daughter was a super high creative and a very low regulated thinker. So what did that mean? She didn't think in terms of right and wrong. Her brain thought in terms of, is this in or is it out socially? Um, and so she's in school. Her friend got this cool little belly button piercing. It looked really awesome. And she thought, oh, that's so cool. I want to get one of those too. So she just goes home and says, oh, I want to do what she did and get this. Well, what happened was when her mother saw what she wanted to do, basically in her mind, she's thinking, yeah, that's what whores do. Like that was her thinking. In other words, if me as a mom and a wife decided to go get a belly button piercing and then show it off in public, it would be because I'm advertising my availability. So she took that mindset and projected it onto the daughter who was not, didn't even know that was something that could be thought about. That's how far away from those types of concepts her brain was. So she started accusing the daughter of being a bad person because she wanted to get her belly button pierced. And so it turned into a real big problem. So I went over and explained to everybody how they think. And what was happening was both parents were extremely high regulated in their thinking. There's only one way to skin a cat. And if you skin it any other way, you're wrong. They were both thinking that way. And they also were thinking, uh, you're either in or you're out. So that whole concept came from, you're living my house, you're under my roof, you will do what you, I say, uh, or else. Like, there is no choice here. It's either or. And that's how they think, right? The girl thought in terms of both and. Okay? It's not either or. It just wasn't the way she thought. So when I explained this to the parents, they were intrigued by the concept. 
But as I probed further, all three were there, the mother, the father, the daughter. I looked at the daughter and I said, now I have a couple questions for you. Your idea about getting this ornamental jewelry, is it because uh, you're trying to rebel against your parents? And she's crying and she's shaking her head no. No. Is it because uh, you think it's going to give you license to do bad things? No. You know, why do you want one of these? Well, Susan's got one and everybody loves it. And when that moment happened, you could see the light go on in the, both parents. In other words, they were thinking, wait a minute, we have misinterpreted her motives. Now, why does this happen? It happens a lot. I'll tell you exactly why. People that have a strict thinking set or excessive attention towards structured thinking, they want to take what they think and make sure everybody thinks it. Okay? This is why every religion has to, it's, it's not fine for me to believe this. I got to get you to believe it too. Like, it's not enough for me to believe it and be happy and leave everybody alone. No, I got to create campaigns. I got to write literature. I got to go put books in little tracks underneath your windshield wipers at the store. Like, I've got to involve everybody else in my thinking because if it's right for me and it's, and I have to obey this, Everybody has to obey it or else it isn't fair. And this is how this works. And this is why you talk about, you know, religious uh, ideological tribes. Every one of their goals is to take over the world. Um, and so it's, you know, uh, you know, there's some real radical extremists out there on any side of this equation, you're going to have this. You know, some people in the name of God are blowing up an abortion clinic and other people in the name of God are blowing up a bunch of innocent people um, and so forth and so on. Yes, Jair, absolutely. It becomes an enforcement strategy to take what I think and place it on everybody else because if I have to obey this, not that I enjoy doing it, you got it too or else it isn't fair. And this is how the brain thinks. And people are going to try to take my words here and take this situation, slice it up all different ways in order to come up with post hoc reasons as to why they've bought into whatever ideological viewpoint they've bought into. But this is how it all works. Um, and so it's very important that you understand what's happening. If it's wrong for me to dump grease down my sink and affect the pipes in a negative way. It's wrong for you to dump grease down your sink and affect your pipes in a negative way. So if I really think that way and I'm visiting a friend's house for dinner and I see them start to dump grease down the sink, what am I going to do? I'm going to go, whoa, 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 what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm dumping the grease. You can't dump it down there. Why? That's going to screw up your pipes. Some people see them dumping the grease and go, hey, my pipes. <laughs> I don't care what he does, right? What do we call that? To each his own. Right? We live in a world with a concept of to each his own. You can do what you want. I'll do what I want as long as you're doing what you want and what you want doesn't affect me in a negative way. But you see, this isn't how religion works. I'm going to do what I feel like I'm supposed to do and you got to do it too. And if not, I'm not going to hang around with you. <laughs> okay? That's just how it works. So I get that. So it's extremely powerful. But all of this is wrapped up into this whole structured thinking mindset. We're thinking in, in we're, our brains are in a structure. It's called coloring within the lines. Okay, certain people in their life, as they're living their life, they're like, it's like they're coloring in a coloring book. And if they go outside the lines, they tear that page out, crumple it up, and throw it away, start anew. Because their life book can't have any pages where we've colored outside the lines. And when they're with other people, those other people can feel. They feel it when they do something that is outside of the lines. How often am I debriefing 
uh, a couple, uh, a child, uh, a family, a business, a, a partnership. Uh, what, and these things, these things consistently are coming into play. And so we have to understand not only how we think, but how other people think. And you as a human being, you have to learn how to honor other individuals and how they think. I'm not talking about honoring serial killers. I'm talking about honoring great people, good people who see things differently. But the problem is, if you don't see it like I see it, you are just plain wrong. And this is what happens. And that creates a crevasse. And then there's a distance. An emotional distance sets in. Blah, 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 blah. Before you know it, it's us against them. And this is how these things happen. They begin in the structured thinking realm. Okay? Very, very powerful. All right. Um... What else can we do? Let's go to the inner world dimension. But before we do, we're going to revisit real quickly the outer world dimension. So if you remember, the first one was intrinsic and that had to do with empathy. You can go back to the other video, video and see that. Empathy. How well do I understand how other people are feeling and how much of what they are feeling can I see? Right? Versus a diminished view of what they're seeing and feeling. And then on top of that, how attached or detached am I from what I understand that they feel? All right? That's the intrinsic dimension. The next dimension was extrinsic. That's the scientific word, but it's the doer. And it has to do with knowing what to do and when to do it. All right? And then the, the next dimension was the one we just looked at and that was the the systemic dimension, which comes from the word systems. Um, and that is the structured thinking model. Now, these dimensions are going to carry over from the outer world to the inner world. It's the same thing, inner world. All right. So the first thing we're going to look at in the inner world is self-worth. This is inner dimension one. So... The outer dimension of self-worth is empathy. So it's not my worth, it's your worth. How well can I see and understand and what kind of clarity do I have around what you are worth? Self-worth has to do with what kind of understanding and clarity do I have around my worth? Where am I at? How do I feel about me? Right? What does that look like? So how clearly do we see and understand our own feelings and our own value? How valuable am I? In other words, what am I worth? What is myself worth? Is it worth anything? So this dimension is really about self-empathy. Do I sympathize with myself or do I only sympathize with other people? Can I empathize with myself or am I only displaying empathy to other people? Do I let you off the hook but I don't let myself off the hook? Do I give you wiggle room but I don't give myself wiggle room? Right? What's happening? And it's important uh, that we know. And so um, this is what self-care is all about. Self-empathy is all about. So it's important that we, you know, have an understanding of how this works. So can I understand my own value? Do I see my worth in association to or in correlation with who I am? So this is about being. Am I a human being? Can I exist and be in the world and be happy, appreciative, caring, empathetic about me, about who I am? Do we understand ourselves better 
than we understand other people? You know, some people don't understand themselves at all. They have no clarity when it comes to themselves. Their clarity is diminished. So rather than seeing, you know, this broader open aperture and overexposing themselves to themselves by bringing the light in so they can see more about who they are and what their capacity for for being is in the world. Well, I'm I'm a compassionate person. I'm a giver. I'm caring. Um, I'm sensitive. Um, I get hurt easy. I wear my heart on my sleeve and then sometimes I don't. Or I can be erratic or whatever. I have attention deficit disorder or I'm, you know, uh, excessive compulsive. I have these issues, but I, I, but I value myself among all these different things. I still have self-value. I know I have worth in the world. My life is meaningful and worth something. Okay. Well, not everybody thinks that. All right. So next thing, do we see what is missing in ourselves or what is abundant? How attentive are we to our own needs? Are we attached or detached from ourselves? This is huge. And it's a real problem because so many people are not attached to themselves. And they're attached to what they think they're supposed to be and they're de not attached to who they actually are. So you can see here on the scale, you can have a negative cautious, a negative or a double negative view of yourself. So what does all this look like? Well, here's what it looks like. So when people are doing things in the world, living and breathing and acting in the world, going to work, supporting a family, cleaning the house, changing the diapers, going to the store, whatever you're doing in the world, you know, we tend to examine our own efforts. Human beings are really good at self-examining. I mean, most human beings, this is going to be a little off color for a second here, but most human beings, after going to the bathroom, they look at it. And, you know, that sounds horrible, but why do human beings do that? They're looking to see if they're, they're going to live and not die. Because if they see blood in there, that freaks people out, right? That's what people are looking for. They're looking to make sure, quote, everything's okay. Um, and it's, and why do we look in mirrors? So I don't know how many of you go to the gym. I know I go to the gym. Do you ever watch people strut around the gym? It, it's kind of fun to watch walking around, kind of looking at themselves, you know, doing the little flex. They walk by the mirror. You watch the shoulders go back a little bit, you know, as they're walking. And some of them, they got that strut. They got the bebops in the ears going. They're walking around and they're looking to see who's looking. Huh? What are they doing? It's called self-examination. Am I okay? Do I look okay? What do you think? This is what the brain does. To the degree that you are not okay with where you are in yourself, you'll be paying, you know, excessive uh, attention to what other people are thinking about you. Because when you think about you, you only see what's missing. My bicep's not big enough yet. Or my legs aren't strong enough yet. Or he squats 350 and I only squat the bar. So I'm embarrassed. So I pick a time to go to the gym where there's not many people there, let's say, so that I can do it and not feel so ashamed, right? This is human beings. This is what we do, okay? And you can put your own stories in there and where you are. Where are most people? Negative attention. That's where most people are. Most people, at least in our database, most people have negative attention towards themselves. They look at what they do and they always think, I could have done that better. I could have done that better. Have you cooked something? You put a lot of energy into cooking something. You know, 10 hours into cooking something, 18 hours into smoking your meat or whatever. And you get all the right sauces, you get all the right ingredients from all the right stores and all the right attention to it and all the right time and all the right spices. And everybody sits down to eat and everybody's eating. You're watching everybody. How does it taste? How is it? Good, 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 good. Great. We love it. This is awesome. What do you do? Yeah, I think you could have added a little more pepper. These are signs, folks. <laughs> These are signs. You got to look for the signs. Like, what does that mean? 
It means that I'm not good enough in who I am and I can't produce anything really well, but better luck next time, right? This is what we do. Now, what you're not going to realize is to the degree this is a rule and there are exceptions. When I say a rule, we'll talk in maybe 80%, okay? When I say exceptions, let's give it a 20% mark. What do people do? They give of themselves and give of themselves and give of themselves in an effort to feel better about who they are. Now, I have a philosophy group that I attend every Friday morning um, in Plano here. And we really have fun. And one of the things that came up today was uh, Mother Teresa. And uh, so this conversation kind of got going and, uh, you know, she was, uh, you know, she, she, you could give her things and she denied herself of all kinds of creature comforts and she denied herself of always different things. And as they're talking about how amazing and benevolent and how she denied herself and all these things, I just looked at her and said, yeah, she's, she was extremely dysfunctional. And they're like, what? Like, how could you say that? And then one of the guys said, you know, I read a book about these letters that she had written and all she talked about is, how her only goal in life was to suffer more than Christ. And I said, that's a form of self-hatred. And you enter into uh, the monastery in order to pay your penance. That's how that works. Okay, now you can say what you want, but I'm telling you what happens and how people uh, feel and how this plays out. Because I don't know about you, but I do this every day and I've been doing it for many, 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 many years. And I'm dealing with people who when I bring these things to the forefront and talk about them, there's a change. And people start realizing, wait a minute, that is why I'm doing that. So to the degree that a person sacrifices the self for others is always a good sign of the degree that they have negative attention on their own selves. And so because the brain tends to focus on what it believes is important, those who focus excessively on other people see themselves as less important and other people as more important. Now that's fine, okay? That's fine. But if those things get out of balance, there's a tipping point. And once that tipping point is reached, it's a problem because I have to talk to them. They come here and we got to deal with it. So you got to understand how, how these things work. So what is your self worth? Okay. So you, you, there are people out there. They think I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not tall enough. I just saw this ad on Facebook where you can buy these rubber wedges that have like five different levels. You can take them apart, put them together, put them in your shoes and feel taller. Uh, and the ad was talking about, you know, never be ashamed again or uh, never, you know, like, like, like it's a scarlet letter if you're short or they, you know, I'm bald, right? Mainly I shave my head, but I'm pretty bald on top. So I shave it so it's more uniform. Um, and so I get a lot of ads in my Facebook about hair loss somehow. Okay, <laughs> it's beautiful. But anyway, you know, you got all these goofy things and they're telling you how your hair is going to grow. People don't understand. You can't grow here. It's like people trying to grow their penis. It, you don't, you can't do that. You don't take pills and get a big penis. But people are so discouraged about how they look and how they feel and they just spend the money because it, it, it works. It works. When you play on low self-worth, you'll make a lot of money. Okay? You'll make a lot of money. And so there's always this idea of nothing's good enough. Nothing's good enough. Being satisfied with who you are, where you are, how you are, uh, is a, is a good place to be. I used to be in a, not a great place in that, in that world. I didn't think I was good enough. I'll never forget. In 2011, I was talking with a counselor and I looked at him and said, you know, my problem is I love being a victim. And he started laughing and he goes, nobody's ever said that to me before. I said, yeah, I love being a victim, but the problem is it's starting to get annoying. 
And so one of the things that happened to me was I was getting so annoyed with myself because it wasn't helping me move forward. And it was keeping me in a space that wasn't good. It didn't feel good. My sense of self was hurt. It was, it was weak. It was, uh, anemic. And I needed to boost that up. Well, I mean, I got beat up all the time as a kid. I mean, they would strip me down to my underwear, lock me in a locker, put a combination lock on it, and walk off and leave me in the gym. You know, and then finally, when I finally, somebody comes around and hears me in there. At first, I didn't want to tell anybody I was in there. So I sat in there a while without saying anything because I was too ashamed. Um, so all these different things will play into your mind and affect you as you grow in, in the world. And so to have this understanding of where you are with yourself, how clearly you can see your value will determine how effective you're going to be in your own space. Um, but if you're just comparing yourself with everybody else, you know, you're going to, you're going to have a hard garden to hoe. That's for darn sure. All right, I want to get off that. So this is what we call soul frustration. Um, uh, so soul frustration is really about, I'm not being myself. I was talking to a couple recently and talking about their relationship and different things. And I said to them, both of you, do you feel like you're being your best version of yourself in the relationship? And do you feel like you're able to be your best version of self and that your partner is supporting you in being your best version of yourself? Or in order, is it in order for me to be my best self, you got to be like this. Okay. If that's happening, that's a problem. Okay, and we've talked about that in the Never Neverland series on my YouTube channel. You can go there for the rest of that. But these things are are can be crippling. So, are you able to be your best self in your life, in your work, in your relationships? If not, you got to fix it. All right. Number two, I excessively achieve, and then I'm surprised when someone recognizes my ability. So I self deprecate. Well, what does that look like? Well, let's say you're putting a lot of energy into something and then somebody says, wow, you know what about, you know what I noticed about you? You are really amazing. And your brain's first responder says, you're just saying that because you're my friend or you're just saying that because you're my husband or you're just saying that because you're family or you're just saying that because you're my kid or you're just saying, you know, that whole, you're just saying that because means it ain't true and you're lying to me to make me feel better about me. Oh, well, you know, you know, newsflash, likely completely untrue. And this morning in the philosophy group, I was telling people, you know, one of the, one of the best things you can do, and I work with people on doing this, when you have a lower sense of self-worth and it's getting in your way, is to send, you know, out an email to 20 different people that know you and care about you and ask them to send you five bullet points that cover some things about you that they see as valuable. So after you're done, you've got 100 board bullet points of personal value that you can go through and see your value. Now, this is difficult to do, and it's difficult to do the right way. So I'm going to jump to a gospel narrative in the New Testament where there's a section where it says that Jesus said to his disciples, quote, who do people say I am? What do people say about me? What do they say? Who do they say I am? Any takers? And then, you know, you got some takers. Oh, some say you're Elijah the prophet and some say this and some say that. But, you know, Peter comes out with, well, let me tell you what I'm thinking. And then Jesus says to Peter, well, you didn't get that on your own accord. That came to you from somewhere in the other. Blah, 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 blah. You know that story, maybe, maybe not, but that's the story. But I want to focus on one piece of that where I get the greatest value out of that particular little narrative. And it's this. Who do men or people, men, men and women, all right, don't get all weird on me, but who do people say that I am? Why didn't he just say, all right, guys, sit down. I got something to talk to you. I want to tell you about myself. I want to tell you who I am. Like, why didn't he do that? Well, here's why. When somebody knows you 
cares about you and loves you for who you are, their idea about who you are is going to be more accurate than your idea about who you are. And this is true across the boards. All right. And so unless you have a disorder called narcissism. All right. That's a disorder. You need to go get help and medication for it. All right. So um, I'm not talking about that. But normal, there is normal. It's where 68% of the population is falling on a norm chart. There is normal. It's where most people are at uh, on a norm scale. All right. Normal people, they don't do that. They look at themselves and they're like, do you really think that? So I did this exercise with a guy one time, I don't know, a couple of years ago. And he was in his mid forty, mid to late 40s, not married, worked as an engineer, didn't like his job, didn't like himself, was in a real tough spot coming into that um, place of being in the world where you're in, you're halfway done with your life and you're looking at it and trying to examine what kind of um, profitable things have I brought to the world at this point in my life? And the answer is like, well, in this guy's case, not much, right? So I had him mail this email to 20 people that he believed knew him, appreciated him, cared about him in some way. And it was hard for him to come up with 20 people, but he did it. All right, and sent that out. Um, and I was to reconnect with him in a week or two. So I did. And we get on the phone and he's 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 giddy. All right, he's he's laughing. He's like, well, this is really great exercise. He's, all, he's kind of come out of his shell a little bit, right? So I'm saying, so, you know, why don't you email me, email me your list? So he did. And he goes, I said, what did you find most surprising? He said, four women told me I was very good looking. And he got emotional. To him, this was news to him. Never heard it before, right? Never thought it. Furthest thing from the truth in his own mind. So here's the next thing he says. Do you think it'd be all right to put this on my resume? <laughs> I, I laughed. I'm thinking, oh my God, this guy's so cute, right? It, 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 it was a B12 shot. And I said, listen, you need to take these people's word for it. All right. You need to take these people's word for it because they know you better than you know you because your self clarity is diminished. Their clarity isn't. All right. And so sometimes we have to go out there and solicit this information and replace our own information with the new information and then live according to the new information. When you do, life gets better. So are you a human being doing or are you a human being? In other words, is your worth coming from what you do, but it doesn't come from who you are? That's a problem, right? Um, does your energy come from what you do or who you think you will become in the future. We can measure this. I can look at graphs and I can see that people are uncomfortable with who they are, but they're anticipating who they're becoming, who I'm going to be. The problem is if you don't reconcile who you are right now, you will never arrive at who you're going to be because it's only predicated upon who you are right now. If you can't come to grips with that, you'll never come to grips with the other. It's not possible. So every time you get to 2020, you're thinking about who you're going to be in 2021. And when you get to 2021, you're thinking about who you're going to be in 2022. And it just keeps going because you never reconcile who you are. You never accept yourself for who you are. You never embrace yourself for who you are. You're too busy wanting to be somebody else. And it's a big problem. So something to think about. So this particular measurement, this intrinsic inner world view is called self-worth or self-esteem. Where does your steam come from? So we're pretty much at the end here. And um, I'm not going to get into the next one because I don't want to go as long to finish it because it'll take me over an hour. But I thank you for joining, um, joining in. So this is Axiology Part 2. We're going to move into Axiology Part 3 on our next time uh, that we get together and I uh, appreciate you guys listening and we'll talk soon and you know if you want to go over these videos and kind of get that in you and learn about this a little bit and think about yourself you know it's a good exercise it's a really good exercise well thanks for listening and we'll chat again later